Okay, guys, we're going to get back started here. I'm going to turn it back over to Mary Louise as we uh, turn to our dads for our next session. Okie dokie. You can walk back to your tables, but I'm just going to start. Um, the most common question that mums ask me is, how do I get my husband doing this? How do I get my dad involved? Um, how do I get my granddad involved? And so I thought we'd take it to the experts and get the dads themselves to answer the question. Um, so here are some awesome Angelman AAC dads. We have uh, Jeremy Meisner, Mick Wong, David Rosenblatt. Um, and now, because they've got a more blokey style of entertaining and presenting, they'll be sitting down. Um, they don't have a wine or beer at this time of the morning, but you could imagine them just having that with them as they're chatting. So I turn it over to the gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So who wants... I can turn it. I'm the button pusher. All right, there we go. You want to? Okay, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Mick Wong, and uh, we're from San Francisco, and I am the father to Lily Grace, who, as uh, in the previous session, uh, her mom mentioned, she's turning eight on Monday, and uh, she uses uh, a pod, she uses uh, a high-tech and a light-tech, and here is um, an older video uh, of Lily Grace. I haven't got sound, Drew. More to say. Oh, it's, it's low. I think they control it from the back. Can someone help me with sound, please? There we are. Thank you. I have something to say. More to say. Oh, I like this. Turn the page. Beautiful. Your hair is beautiful. So, so this is early on um, trying to model and me learning how to use it, and um, and I think that one of the things that's like hard to watch about that is it's it takes me a long time to model, but I think it's good for her to see that we're learning it too, and and it's also modeling how you can look through and how you can learn and make if you make a mistake that's okay and how to how to recover from that so um and obviously the motivation for me um is when i realize that she understands what i'm saying and you know wants to give me a kiss because she liked what i said so <laughs> there we go we can i think we can move on to the next one so this video is me uh, modeling with my son, Nico, who is five, as we walk to the subway station near our house. What is that noise? It looks like he's hammering. I wonder, wonder what he's going to make. Make. Do you want to keep going to the metro? Metro. Let's go. That is really cool inside the lobby. 
and they have a screen with all those buttons. Yeah, that button is for when people need help. But right now, it's time for us to help. help. Go. Metro. Let's go to the Metro. We don't need to call anybody inside there. We're not visiting anybody in that building. Let's over, head over to the Metro. So, we can stop it here. So does anybody else's voice go up like three octaves when you're <laughs> parenting? Hi, how are you doing? Um, so when I look at that video, you know, my, my critical inner voice says, well, he's not even really paying attention when you're modeling and your modeling is sort of slow and like, what are you even getting out of this, right? He's just looking at everything else on the street. But when I, when I think about that video, I think that me showing Nico how to use the talker is maybe like the third most important thing that's happening in that video. I think that the first most important video, thing in that video is that I'm practicing using the talker, right? And I'm practicing using the talker upside down and while walking and holding my cell phone and trying to keep my son from like walking into random buildings. Um, and secondly, I'm showing solidarity with him in public. I'm wearing the device on my chest just while he's wearing the device on his chest, and I'm normalizing the idea that we wear iPads in public and we use them to talk. And then the third thing I'm doing is showing him that we can use our communication device to comment on things that we're interested in, on you know what the heck is going on with that guy who's hammering on the street. Um, and then the other thing I see in that video is that there are so many things going on for him right now. When he's walking down the street, he is putting a lot of energy into coordinating his movements, taking in a lot of stimulus, being curious. Um, and it is very unlikely, in my experience, that he is going to spontaneously communicate in the middle of all of that. And so it's really important for me, when I'm doing this, to have really low expectations about, you know, okay, he's not talking back to me, so why am I even doing this? He's doing like seven other things right now. Um, and so maintaining the communication even in that space is, is really important. Next one. Are we out of, we're out of videos? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think part of what we're trying to show with the videos is that there are a lot of different settings where, where dads are doing communication um, and there's no one right way to do it. But before we get into some of the tips and tricks and approaches that we use, we wanted to address sort of the elephant in the room, which is the, the next slide. Is AAC a mom thing? Uh, you might be wondering, why did the moms who are, let's be honest, are in charge, uh, tell us that we need to do this panel? Um, are we just up here to take credit for having married the right people who were all on the previous panel? Um, so we talked about it, you know, we had some beer last night, and our answer is yes, it's a mom thing. So thanks everybody, <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> so of course not. I think there are a lot of dads in this room who would say AAC is not only a mom thing, but it also makes a lot of sense, in our experience, that dads end up less involved in the AAC project. Um, and one reason I think is that it's really natural in our relationships to create a division of labor between partners and between parents. Um, and it's natural to divide up family jobs to say, you do the cooking, I'll do the dishes, you do the taxes, I'll be playing on my phone in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, like the natural kind of way that you divide up jobs. And so if mom is the first one who gets into the AAC stuff, which often happens, it becomes her thing and you know she's dealing with it and I'm gonna worry about other stuff, right? Um, I remember when we first started doing AAC stuff, I would often say things to other folks that, that diminished my role. Like, she did all the research. She's really the expert on this. And that was true, she had done a lot of that work, but it also sort of got me off the hook. I got to not be responsible for it. And I stopped saying things like that when I started to realize that AAC is not just another family chore, it's more like learning a new language. So you've seen this quote a few times if you wanna move the slide. 
this idea that to learn a new language, we expose uh, typically developing kids to lots and lots and lots of spoken language before we expect them to do anything with that language. Um, and so when you think about spoken language, we don't say, well, dad is responsible for changing the baby's diapers and mom's <coughs> gonna talk to the baby, right? Grandma, you can pick the baby up from daycare, but don't talk to the baby because that's mom's thing, right? Like mom is the one who does the talking. We, everybody talks to the baby. There's no prerequisites. You don't have to be particularly good at talking to talk to the baby, right? We just do it naturally all the time without high expectations. And learning language is the same thing when it's AAC language. It is too important for it to be just one person's job. Um, so another concept that I mentioned earlier and I think we're gonna to touch on more is one that I've learned a lot from Mary Louise and from Aaron Sheldon, which is the concept of solidarity, which is the idea that there's no AAC system in the world that is remotely as easy as speaking, right? All AAC systems suck, right? They are really hard to learn, they are hard to use, they are slow, they are clunky, and part of what we do as parents, as dads, when we are modeling alongside our kids is we are showing them and we are experiencing what, is it, what it's like for them to communicate. And we are showing them that we are with them in that fight and we will be with them on the playground, we will be with them you know, at the grocery store and we will sympathize with the idea that sometimes it's easier for them to grab somebody, sometimes it's easier for them to grunt or point at something and that it has to be really motivating and important for them to go through the work that we know how hard it is. Um, so I find that the more energy I put into learning it myself, the more compassion and solidarity and connection I have with my kid, and the less frustrated I get when he's not talking back every single time because I know how much energy that requires. Um, and so even if my modeling in a day, the only outcome is I've become more comfortable with the system, I, I wanna consider that a victory, right, for now. Um, and not put all the, all the expectation on him, take a lot of that back on, on myself. Um, so that's our spiel about why AAC is for, for dads and not just for moms. Um, and uh, we're gonna move on and share some examples and some interest questions from other families. For sure. So uh, today I'm gonna speak to the questions, uh, what helped me get started, um, different for everybody. But uh, getting started is obviously what's, what comes first. And for me, uh, I can remember uh, jumping in by taking a, a pod training. I was fortunate enough to, uh, um, to, to fly to Massachusetts and, and, and take a training. And it was, I was away for the weekend, and it was tough. But um, I remember being there and, and, and getting back to my hotel at the end of the first day and uh, calling my wife and saying, um, we're going to give Kate a voice. Kate is going to be able to communicate. It was that, uh, it was that impressive the first day. Um, it was overwhelming. It's so much information. It happened so fast. But um, that feeling right away and, and having that training and seeing the potential for it was incredible. That was a great leap off point um, to, to, to start with, to get started. Um, after that, of course, through, through the training and, and, and everything that we've had, you know, the, the first recommendation when I had our training with our, our, our AC, we use, a, we use a pod system, was to make sure we had the pod all the time. And, and so the first thing to do was to, to set goals, to make sure we had goals for ourselves. Me in particular, I wanted to make sure I had the goal of making sure the pod was always with Kate or always available to Kate. And uh, it's a simple goal. And when you started simple and we, I was able to, to, to accomplish that. You, you, we felt that success. I felt that success. Kate felt the success. It was always there. Was she always engaged? No. No, not at first. Um, in fact, she probably wasn't terribly engaged until we converted to a, a high-tech system where she um, was able to use, uh, use an iPad. She was much more uh, drawn to the screen and the voice output. Uh, and then we started to see more success. But, but having it there and knowing that it was there, that was her voice, um, I think was a, a, great, a great stepping stone. Uh, even for me. Uh, now the goals continue to change. It's, it's making sure that I, I, I set and make goals for myself. I've become quite proficient using the AAC for, again, the division of labor jobs that, that I will generally tend to. You know, I, I'll do a bath at the end of the day, or if I'm administering medicine, or uh, those, those things I'm, you know, I'm, you know, 
easy to easy to to follow along. But now my uh, you know my goal is to make sure that every day that I'm talking about something new and different, that we're exploring something else in our world, again to continue for me to expand my own understanding and knowledge of the language, as that's what it is. It's it's a new language. Um, I don't know other languages, and uh, this is one that I'm learning. Um, and it's not easy. Language acquisition at my age is tough. Uh, thankfully for the, the kids, it's a, it tends to be a little bit a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> and, and and helping me get started, the the, the thing that really helped me is I, I got to play to my strengths. Um, I'm a little bit of a nerd, um, technology wise. I, I enjoy tinkering with computers and uh, um, uh, devices. So. My job within uh, the, the introduction of the, uh, the AAC was to set up the iPads and to install the software, to make sure that it was available to uh, Kate's classmates, um, to make sure that we update uh, the AAC with information as we see uh, fit, as, as Kate transitions from class to class, as her peers change, as uh, her environments change, um, or for people just recognizing that there are, there are words that they can't find or might be missing that we need to make sure that we add. Um, all of those things really, you know, helped get started. Um, after that, um, one moment that made it feel worthwhile, but it's impossible to talk about one moment that makes it feel worthwhile. Um, all of the moments make it feel worthwhile. If that's the beauty from the moment to, to know that communication was a possibility, um, was, it was an incredible epiphany. Um, but to the most recent moment that made it feel worthwhile, Mary Louise at the, at the end of the last session asked the crowd how many parents are using a robust AAC with their children. And I saw more than half the hands go up in this room. And I think back to the, my, my first gala five years ago, um, the number of parents who would be using a robust system would not be close to that number. And that moment made it feel worthwhile for me to see that there's this community out here. And, and many of you I have never met or seen or talked to, but we share a connection. And to see that, 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 that systems are in use uh, is just absolutely amazing. Uh, it's, it's breathtaking. Um, but again, lots of other moments that make it feel worthwhile. Kate, uh, in the car with her AAC while we're driving, will often babble, um, you know, hitting different, you know, elementary school, elementary school, elementary. No, Kate, it's we, it's it's Saturday. We're not going to go to school today. You get you get the weekend off. Um, we. Uh, um, here we are. Sorry. Oh, um, I, I got a, I got a great opportunity uh, uh, two weeks ago to to go to school. They were doing a field trip and. I came into school and it's, she's in a grade two class and it's pure chaos, of course, because it's grade twos. And uh, I walk in and, and, and the kids are like, oh, hey, you're Kate's dad. And they grab, they, they grab the talker and they come up to me and they say hi and they, they, they make sure to grab Kate and they, they, they start communicating. They, they're sharing all of this, uh, this, this, again, around the AAC. It's, it's kind of the thing that brings them together. It's, a, it's an incredible moment to, uh, to, to, to see. Um, and even just last week, uh, Kate was at, Oh, great, mo great moment at uh, her uh, her dance class. Uh, she has an arts uh, class, and uh, the teacher came out and said, "Kate, Kate says on her talker that she's having a seizure. She keeps saying seizure, seizure, seizure." So I, okay, so I'm gonna go in and, you know, Kate's Kate's fine. Kate's okay. She's and when I go in, it was uh, um, it said seizure, 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 and then it, it says. Uh, um, not at the end. And so we all had that, and, and she had that, you know, not a, not a smile, she had that sly smile, yeah, that was funny. and she gave me a hug and, and we, we went back to it. So, you know, to, to be able to use humor as well is, is, is important. Those, those moments are really, really special. Uh, we try and assign meaning everywhere we can with the, with the AAC. Uh, assign meaning means so much. Um, and, and those moments that, that feel worthwhile, sometimes there's, there's great distances. You know, we've implemented the system and we've had success, and then we might have long periods where we don't see any success, and um, and then all of a sudden it will happen again. And these focused bursts of of, of learning happen, and and it, it's, it rejuvenates us. And it's not that we wait for it, but we know that every time that these bursts happen, that time in between starts to get smaller and smaller, and and, and we know ultimately uh, that that voice will be there um, for Kate. Um, you know, we. Our, we started with a goal. We wanted to make sure she could, you know, be mobile, and then she was able to be mobile. And then we said, well, why, let's make sure she can use the, the washroom. We'll work on the potty, and we've had success with the potty. And now, what's, what's where's where's the limit that we put on it? Let's let's make sure that she has language, and that makes it feel uh, worthwhile. If you want the la next next slide there, um, and for me, this is something that 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 really helps me. I'm an instant mastery kind of guy. I don't. 
I don't do anything unless I can be good at it right away. Um, or before AAC, that was my style. You can ask my wife about a skiing incident that when she tried to teach me how to ski, it did not end very well. Um, I don't play, you know, squash with my brother because he totally would kick me in the, you know, and he's, and he's younger than me. I'm the big brother. I'm supposed to be better. Instant mastery. But AAC has really taught me that it's not about instant mastery. It's about learning and, and mistakes are proof that you're trying. If you're not making mistakes, you're not doing anything. And, and status quo just doesn't, that, that just doesn't cut it. Nick, sorry. No, it's okay. Off to you, Mick. Okay. So, my turn. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, what I find the hardest and, uh, and how I deal with that and how to keep this fun and meaningful. Um, and so I wanted to talk actually uh, in my journey, and I'm in the middle of this journey uh, with my family, and it, 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 has, it changes. And so one of the things that sticks out to me the most is uh, when I first started using Pod with Lily Grace <clears throat> is that it was just so overwhelming. It, you know, um, aside from, you know, just, you know, getting the diagnosis and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> and um, just the day-to-day -day challenges and all those things that, um, that, that we all deal with every day, um, like just looking at pod and saying, where do I start with this? You know, it, this is like this whole language that, like Jeremy was saying, it's like, I'm not good at this yet, so um, what, what do you do? Um, and it's, it could be something that really freezes you and like you just don't do anything about it. But um, this saying always comes up in my head when I think about this. And it's, someone asks, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And the, the, the other person says, one bite at a time. And so you, you, if you think of the process of like learning pod and you want to learn all of it all at once, I, of course, that's understandably really, really overwhelming. Um, but, but if you break it down and say, OK, well, this week, um, I just want to make sure that it's available. I just want to make sure that if anyone wants to use it, it's there. If, if, if we go and get up and go to the bathroom, it's there. If we go and say, oh, I forgot something in the car, we have to go to the car to get it, it's, it's there for that too. Not just, oh, we're going on a trip, I've got to make sure I pack it. Like, it has to be there, it has to be available. Um, so like, that's, that's one of the, the things that um, like you, you break it down or you know if you're past that and you're at a point where you're like I realize that I'm not modeling um, so then you know it's like well let's see you know we can go and like comment on things and like if you're starting off early you can pick like in pod you can pick a branch that goes down like saying if you like something or you don't like something and especially with you know Younger kids, it's easy to say, you know, I have more to say, I don't like this yucky, which uh, a story behind that was um, uh, I'm a trained chef uh, and I cook most of the meals for my daughter. And so one day I made her dinner and she was fussy. And she, you know, like most kids, sometimes she doesn't want to eat her dinner. And so I was just, I was next to her and she wanted to use her pod and she was getting very upset and she she said more to say I don't like this yucky which made me really really happy but really kind of hurt <laughs> on a personal level um, so um, you know at, it, it's one of those things that um, it, and it was available, and it was something like we had modeled. I don't, I don't think, oh no, we had modeled that uh, because there are lots of things that are yucky, you know, and it's fun to go and point out things with little kids like that's yucky, or 
or if you like it. So, so some of those, that's some of those I, the ideas that um, you know, I would just break down and like once you get to that and, and do that for a week or so or whatever's comfortable for you, then you just challenge yourself to do a little bit more. Um, and sooner or later you realize, wow, I'm actually doing a lot more than I thought I could ever do. Um, when you first look back at the first day, you were saying, what am I supposed to do with this thing? You know, this is my daughter's communication device. I don't know how to use it. Um, so um, it's, it's a really, uh, it's, it was a real big eye opener uh, to look back at that for me um, when we were putting together this presentation to, to see how different it is. And it's just one step at a time um, to do that. Uh, to talk about what's hard now, now that I'm in the journey now, is that um, sometimes uh, life happens and you realize that you, you're in a rut with, the, uh, with your device and maybe you haven't been modeling very much. Maybe you've just been using it to just, um, just do little chats here and there, uh, but you haven't been doing anything else. And so, you know, that's, that's the time where I just have to look back in myself uh, what my motivation is, and um, and uh, obviously my motivation is that uh, I want to be able to communicate with my daughter. I, I've had friends who really horribly have, you know, when, I, when I've mentioned that Lily Grace is not verbal, have told me, well, you should be thankful because when she's a teenager, she won't tell you to F off. Um, It'll be in her blood book, Nick. Yes. Right. <laughs> so on that day, I will not be upset. That's right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and that's how I deal with those things. Um, uh, and how I keep it fun and meaningful, well, I mean, I don't know. For people who know us, um, it's not that far of a stretch to realize that we're pretty silly people, especially when we're around Lily Grace. And so... Um, <laughs> and so, um, so I just try to figure out, like, in those natural situations, I don't try to fabricate a situation that, okay, I need to use a pod, so I'm going to go and do this completely new thing that we've never done before, and if she likes it or not, we're going to do it, because it's going to, we're going to learn how to use this, because that just is going to, we're going to crash and burn, and and bad things might be said, <laughs> but um, but you know I I look at what we do and what we have fun doing and see from the things that we do, um, uh, playing games if they're structured or not, um, and see how I can go use the book to like what are things that I say a lot when when we're just playing, you know. Um, aside from, no, nope, don't grab that, don't touch that, aside from those things. But like when we're playing in, in whichever things that we like to do, I, real, I try to realize, oh, I could be using this, and then I figure it out, and then I just start modeling those things that we're doing. Um, and I, and the, I think that keeps it fun and meaningful at the same time, because she's seeing it in a context that she understands, and she's like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, this is, this is what happens in life. This isn't, it's not something that just shows up because we're doing something new. This is like, we're, we're playing in the living room or we're playing in the pool or whatever. It's, and that's just part of our life. And I think that's probably the most powerful thing uh, for us, um, at least one of them. So mm -hmm. thank you. I, Next. I, I think we're up for, um, yep, so yeah, we actually have this new group, AAC Dads, uh, and it's brand new, so um, you can find that on Facebook, and I think we're going to open up for some questions. Oh, yeah, sure, come on up to the, uh, come on, come on up to the microphones. <laughs> Yes, sorry, if you come to the mic, then the people on the live stream can hear you. 
And you get your cardio. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Rick, and my angel is six. I'm his grandfather. I'm kind of used, uh, new to the AEC. Um, I noticed that you were talking about using two devices. Do you recommend two devices, one for him and one for me constantly, uh, as we're learning this? Or can we um, share devices? So I can give a shot at this. In, in our family, we use two devices. Um, Nico wears one on a harness on his chest, and we have a separate modeling device that we use as parents and his brothers use sometime. I, I think that is not a setup that is going to work for everybody. It's expensive to have extra devices. One way to deal with that is to have a light tech uh, option as well. So the picture that's up here is Nico in the bathtub with a laminated paper version of the home page of his device. So sometimes if we don't have our modeling talker around, we might use a paper version that looks the same and just verbalize what we're modeling. Um, sometimes if, if I don't have the modeling talker nearby, I might even ask his permission to use his uh, to model. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a personal decision about um, what's comfortable for you and your kid. It gets a little bit awkward when he's wearing the device and you're like, get over here so I can model on your device. And it feels a little bit invasive of his space. Um, so if, if your kid is wearing the device, I might... I might try to use another tool, whether it's light tech or, or high tech. Just a, a supplemental question. Um, my grandson has gone through speech therapy, which is terrible. I'm sorry, I, I, my personal opinion, because he's got a pod that's got two words on it. Yes, no. You know, mm. that's it. And so I see all of this that you've got what, several dozen words. So. Do you, did you start with multiple words, or did you start with just yes, no, more, not, a, uh, you know, just how simple did you begin with, or did you just go right into it? Well, Mary, I'm sure Mary Louise can absolutely speak to this, but the, the beauty of pod is it's pragmatic language. It's all language. It's not just words. It's the ability for uh, a child to communicate <laughs> anything or, or, or everything that potentially they would like to communicate. So um, yes, we, we, we work on yes and no, but at the same time, the pod is there to, to encapsulate all language. So the idea is that you are going to talk to your child in a way that one day they'll talk back to you. So you need lots and lots of language because you don't know what you're going to say, but we also don't know what their first word is going to be. And life is very boring when it's all about more and finish. And most children with Angelman have very clear ways of telling you if they want more or if they're done. Right. So we need to be able to comment about it. Oh, I like this. I want some more. Oh, no, get rid of that. Shove that off the table. Oh, you're done with that. Maybe that was yucky. Maybe that was boring. Um, you know, I think it's um, high praise if children tell you that things are boring. Kids with Angelman are the barometers for what's going on in the classroom. You know, if, if they're bored, they let you know. It's just all the other kids are just as bored. They're just don't, not showing it. They're just a bit more polite about it. Um, so I would be saying to the speech therapist, we want to look at a whole language system. And certainly you can target more and finish, but you can also comment. You can say, let's go to the park. Oh, you want your bike. Oh, you want to ride your bike some more. So you can comment and, and you can ask questions, but you need a whole language. So I'd start a discussion with a the speech therapist. Okay, what's her vision? Because you need to say, my vision for my child is that he has a language that he can use some gesture, some sign, maybe some speech, maybe some um, word approximations, but, and that he has a full symbolic language. So that's my vision for him. What's your vision for him? And when you get on the same page about that, suddenly they start to say, mm, okay, yes. So I would be revisiting with the speech therapist everything that you've learned here today um, about a whole language system for your grandson. Because um, life's very boring when it's just more, more, more. And requesting more, more, more tells the children that all they can do is take from the world. And people with Angelman syndrome have a lot to contribute to this world. And I think it's offensive if we just presume that they want to take. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, our daughter is two, um, and we are just now learning about the AAC. Um, I've kind of pushed it with a therapist before, but it's more feeding and, you know, just sign language, which... <laughs> But um, I'm curious in the sense of siblings. If we do bring this home, we're really excited to get started into it, jump right in. Um, but her siblings are five and seven, and they really are good with technology, but they're also really good with just going crazy. Is it better to introduce it as like a one-on-one -on -one with her in the beginning, where it's just, you know, me and dad working with her? Or is it good to bring the kids in and say, kind of go crazy, because they will? <laughs> um, is that too overwhelming for them when they first get started? Or it's probably a silly question, but. Yeah, so our kids are, I think about this in two ways, because we obviously have siblings. You know, we have the twins who are three, but we also have kids on the playground. We have kids at church. We have kids at school. And so there's going to be a lot of typical peers who are going to have a lot of curiosity about the communication system. And I think we take two approaches generally. One is to really be positive about everybody using the system. I've seen some professionals and some parents who are like, no, no, don't touch that. You know, that's, that's, that's an iPad, you might break it, right? And we try to put a case on everything that you're not gonna break it, and so it's okay if a kid at the playground or your older kids are playing with it. Um, and we try to be really excited when other kids want to use it at the playground, at school, at church, at home, because we think that Nico is going to be more motivated to use it if other kids are using it and it's normalized that way. So we show anybody who's interested. At the same time, other kids can sort of dominate it and yeah. take up a lot of space. And we try to make space for Nico as well. And so if his brothers try to take away his talker so they can play with it, um, we try to do a balance and say, no, here's the modeling talker. You know, you get to use okay. this one. That's Nico's. It's his voice. He's talking with it and create real um, boundaries where we're saying he has the right to communicate the way he's going to communicate and nobody should get in the way of that. Okay. Um, and, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's a challenge, yeah. you know, and um, other kids are going to babble with the device and you have to figure out, like with, just with any kid, you know, who's saying random words and yelling inappropriately, you know, how to give them feedback oh. about what's helpful in the situation. Okay. And um, then my second question kind of goes off of um, what the gentleman just said. With her being two and just now learning it, I know that, you know, two words may not be the greatest and we'll let her babble, of course, just when she's busy. Um, but when we're first starting, should we start with like stop and go, eat, drink, or just, you know, go crazy? Um, do you have speech therapist support? Are they telling you one thing or another? Or We just moved to the new area. Um, and so she's like, I'll do whatever you want to do. But I don't know what to do either. So, okay. so what some families do is have, there's a, um, a way to in most core vocabulary systems. So you might have 60 on your page, 60 words, 60 cells with symbols. You can hide some of them or called masking. So you might just have um, want, go, like, um, what, where. So you've got uh, something to comment with, something to ask a question with, something to boss someone around with. You've got a couple of words that that have different communicative functions. Um, because if you're going to take a 60 cell or a 100 cell device and turn it down to want, well, you may as well have one of those, you know, big, big Mac buttons. Um, and uh, we want whole language. So it's okay to reduce them and then unmask them if you have a plan for unmasking. Mm -hmm. If you are doing the four words a week that Teresa talked about. Okay, this week these are our four words or this month these are our four words. But we are going to be opening more words every week because otherwise, and this happens with schools a lot, we say, okay, these are the four words we're starting with. This is our plan to unmask. And you go back six weeks later and they've still only got four words open. 
Um, so it is possible to do that. It all depends on you know how your child's going with it. It's nice sometimes to unmask things and let the children babble. Um, you know, and with peers and siblings, they'll always find the bathroom words. So be prepared for a lot of bathroom talk. Um, but that's you know the first thing that kids learn in other language. Well, how do I say poo and mum? Yeah, so um, yeah, and that's just what's going to happen. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hi, thank, thanks for being up here today. And uh, I just wanted to ask, for me, um, I modeled for, well, we went to speech therapy for about nine months, twice a week, because it was far away. I'm sorry, twice a month, because it was far away. So I think we had the system for about nine, 10 months before my son actually used it. And I'm just curious, I know that's um, a sort of a typical experience, but I'm just curious, how long did it take for you, for your child, to say the first thing after you were modeling? Yeah, each of you, please answer. Well, yeah. I, I can't. I can't remember. Um, there's, there's so I, I can't. I couldn't put a time frame on it. But what I, what I can offer you is something that we do look at is um, knowing that again, this is a long term goal for us. We. Um, you know, not just a, not just six months, not just a year, not just where we're, we're saying in 10 years, let's look at this again and see how far we've come because language acquisition um, using the system will take will take time. Um, and and to, to, to look at it after a short period of time, uh, I think is unfair to, to everyone involved. But uh, for us, I know that as we continue the the she, Kate does use it to, to say things and we've we've created great meaning. Uh, but that time is shrunk between times where she has uh, a kind of new bursts of uh, of learning. And uh, for Lily Grace, for the, my best recollection, um, when we first started using Pod, it was the light tech. Um, so she did a lot of babbling as well as sensory seeking on the pages and crumpling them up and chewing them and uh, throwing it on the ground and things like that. But I think probably one of the first things that seemed really appropriate and intentional uh, was probably about a year after we maybe a little bit more, um, but it, it, it did definitely feel like it was very slow going in the beginning. Um. And I would say two things. Number one, in the first probably six months, I think we saw words pop up that were nouns and highly motivating. Um, and that's been the consistent the whole way through. His communication is all about what's most important to him. And so requesting showed up first. And so he would say things like Pee Wee Herman, you know, Pee Wee Herman, because he wanted to watch Pee Wee Herman, you know, or talking about the Metro or talking about mom. Um, and those things did show up fairly early on in the process. But the biggest leap we saw in his communication, which I think people have mentioned earlier today, um, is when he started wearing his device. So when he got his harness and when his device was physically on him all the time is where we saw him really up the frequency. And it's still not like all the time. He's not, he's not babbling away, but it's tremendously more likely that he's going to pull it up from his chest to say something than that he's going to move even three feet you know, down the couch to find it. Um, so that, that was really important for us. My son's 12, and my question was, uh, if we gave him his iPad, you know, most of the time he'd just be, like, randomly hitting buttons or, like, getting himself off the app or, like, you know, going on the Internet. How, how do you differentiate between that and, like, uh, like the way the speech therapist, like I said, I heard other people say is, like, you know, he gets choices and all that stuff. But how do you give him, like, free range? In mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for, for us, we... Um, we have a specific or specific iPads that are just talkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just has, I mean, it has the other apps on it, but we can put the iPad in guided access. So the home button doesn't work. So once it's in the pod app, it, um, or the compass uh, with pod app, it, you put it in guided access and then they can't get out of it. Um, <clears throat> So, so that's one way. And so we, she does have a different iPad with a different case, so it looks mm -hmm. very specifically different that she can watch her videos or play her games or um, 
listen to music or any of those things, uh, watch movies. Um, but she has, her talkers are, for us, are specified as talkers. We, she, doesn't, she doesn't get to play games on it. She doesn't get to watch videos on it. She doesn't do any um, educational stuff and no homework or anything. Uh, none of that's done on that iPad. That is just a talker. And like I said, we just we have it locked into that. We're, we're the same way. Yeah, same for us. Um, this will be the last question, I think, because Meg, is Megan still going to talk? Megan still going to talk afterwards? Yes. Okay. So last question. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephanie. My son is nine, and he, I do the same thing. I only give him his talker for just that, no videos, no anything. However, <laughs> he knows when I'm about to give it to him. <clears throat> I tried the harness. He hated it, absolutely hated it. Um, and he doesn't want anything to do with his device. He will not touch it. He knows when I'm bringing it. If I'm not bringing him something that he can watch YouTube on, he doesn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have any suggestions on how I can, I don't know, maybe present it to him again in a different way or? I mean, I think my initial reaction is to say, to take a step back from the sort of high stakes of him using it and just put a lot of emphasis on other people using it. Um, okay. So like it's nearby for him if he wants it, but it's not a pressure thing about you need to use it. But you know what, while you're doing your thing, everybody else around you is gonna use this okay. system to communicate and we're gonna get results and it's gonna be hilarious and I'm gonna tell your sibling or your dad or whoever, you know, to do something funny using the talker and they're gonna do something funny and I'm gonna boss them around and make them do something embarrassing and they're gonna do something embarrassing and it's, it's an activity that you're inviting them to participate in as opposed to like, here's a chore for you to do. Okay, you know? yeah. That's how I felt I was presenting it as a chore and I right. just, yeah. But I did talk on the modeling and it, he just never, he was like, get away from me, mom. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah, and I, I, just to add to that, I think, I think the biggest thing, too, is if, especially if, if your son's not using the device already, um, that you're, that's what your, your job is to just model, model, model. Um, that's, that's what you're going to be doing. You, you should, I think that if you insist on on any kind of performance on it. Uh, I know for our daughter, if you insist her to do anything, she will make it a point in her life to ne yeah. never do it ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I bet if I tried to force her to eat chocolate, she would make sure that I would never get chocolate near her. Uh -huh. Ever again. And yeah. it's chocolate. And it's not, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and it's not that I was ever forcing just the whole idea, if it's not a video or something that I want to yeah. do, and, then but, I don't want anything to do with it at yeah. all. Yeah, and that's, and, and I think in the beginning, <clears throat> I think that's fine that, that they don't have, to, he doesn't have to have anything to do with it because it's, it, it's there. And if you're modeling, he's going to absorb some of that at some point and, and hopefully something's going to click and they're like, Hey, I can use that because I want to say something and other, and I have a Perfect. high enough motivation that I want to use that to to communicate something to my mom or dad. And Thank you. Just on the harness real quick, I know a lot of different kids have different sensory responses to the, to the harness. And if you go to the AAC Literacy and Communication Facebook group, there are a lot of discussions on there about alternative harness strategies. You know, people have modified camera straps mm -hmm. and other things that, that are less likely to sort of push a kid's buttons in terms of sensory stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions, and we're going to take this time real quick to turn it over to Megan Cross. Um, nope. Actually, we're going to do that later. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll pick back up. We'll take a, a quick 10-minute break and resume at 11 o'clock. We'll be here if anybody wants to. And you can visit with these guys during the break. Thank you. Thank you.